I'm Lisa Mensa. I run the initiative on financial security. And most of the year, I have a business card that says Aspen. And I live in Washington, DC. So it's lovely to put the two together and actually work from Aspen right now. So this panel is uh, one of my dreams. And uh, this whole question about building the wealth of tomorrow, tomorrow's America is just a question that I feel ought to be really top in our national discussions. And there's no one I could have asked to keynote that better than Ambassador Young. Ambassador Young has walked with me as I have done this initiative at Aspen over the last nine years. He joined us at one of our uh, Atlanta roundtables. He's come to New York. He is uh, a visionary, and we're lucky to have him with us. So I decided that we shouldn't just bring Ambassador Young. We should bring uh, two of his wonderful colleagues, Kabir Segal. And Kabir is uh, in emerging markets and equity sales at JP Morgan. And John Hope Bryant. And John is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Operation Hope. You'll learn more about both of their paths in this discussion. And thankfully, you don't have to hear from me moderate this discussion, Jared Sandberg, who's the editor of Bloomberg, uh, com uh, is going to join us today and help me to moderate this. So, Jared, I'm going to hand this over to you and enjoy the next hour. Thank you very much. Um, I am, of course, honored to be here. I think you would expect anyone to say that. I'm also thrilled and I'm especially just psyched to be on stage with these three gentlemen who all are uh, extremely cool in their own way. Um, uh, you know, if we have to field a team to fix the income gap, in inequality gap, um, and the sort of address the problems of the wealth debate. This is probably about, this is the A team. Um, but given that the audience is also stacked with great expertise, what I'd like to do is keep it short, tight 45 minutes. I have about 10 or so questions that I'm sure I will throw out and completely forget about. Um, and so I would count on a lot of you folks to ask questions as well, because the good thing about modern media is that we don't have to guess as editors what interests you. We can simply ask or read the posts that you send us all the time. So we will welcome that. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I know what to call Kabir Sagal, who is Why don't we just all go by first names? Really? Yeah. You don't want to be like no. the Honorable Andy? No. <laughs> okay, because John is, has been knighted by German nobility, so I thought I'm I would call you Sir John. Hope. I'm definitely just John. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, <coughs> I just wanted to start a little bit in the past because I think it may be instructive about where we are in the present, and then I'd love to move on to solutions, which I've been eager to talk about. And today, earlier today, uh, a lot of the discussions were really in the weeds of this, some of these solutions, so hopefully I can understand exactly what we're all talking about. But the first question I wanted to get to was, um, given your position and your place in history in the civil rights movement. I'm curious to know if you could rewrite the legacy of the civil rights movement. What would you do? Because I get a sense, having just read your mentee, your godson's book, Walk in My Shoes, which is all about conversations with you, I get the sense that you feel that there is a tremendous amount of unfinished business to the civil yeah. rights movement. Well, very quickly, Martin Luther King and most of us, uh, most of you look like you're close to my age were products of the New Deal. And if you got any money, you got it because from 1932 right on through to 1944, there was a stable economy where the government and business intention, but they produced together. Um, Martin Luther King came into being toward the end of the New Deal. Uh, but down south, we were still thinking that our goal was to make the New Deal work for those of us who were black. Because in the South, racial segregation prevented the New Deal from working for us. So all we wanted was a piece of the New Deal. Now, if he had lived 10 years longer, he would have understood that, uh, well, maybe he wouldn't have understood. Maybe we would have succeeded and making the New Deal not only work for black people, but making the New Deal, and when I say the New Deal, I mean democratic small d capitalism. We would have made capitalism work not only for black people in the middle and upper middle class, but we, which we did. But 
he was killed when he raised the question of can democracy and capitalism work for poor people as it has worked for the middle class and the upper class? And if he had had a chance to live, we might have answered that. If Robert Kennedy had had a chance to live, we might have an answered that. But neither of them did, and I was left sort of holding the bag very mad. <laughs> because I would have much preferred dying and going on to heaven because at that time we felt we'd earned a place in glory. <laughs> uh, but I was left with all of the crap and ended up in Congress <laughs> uh, where I saw the crap explode and nobody took notice of it. In September of 1973, George Schultz Paul Volcker and um, Federal Reserve Chairman. Greens? No. Arthur uh, Levitt. Oh, Paul Volcker was. No, Paul Volcker was Secretary, Under Secretary. Uh, Arthur Burns. Uh, the three of them came to the Banking Committee. I'm on the Banking Committee. I'm a preacher. Never had a course in economics. And they come to say it's time for us to get rid of the Bretton Woods agreements. I leaned over and I asked Ed Koch, what are the Bretton Woods agreements? <laughs> he leaned over and asked somebody else, what are the Bretton Woods <laughs> Nobody knew what was going on. And yet we were so intimidated by these three gentlemen that we went along. I was one of the few people who asked the question. I said, look, I don't really understand this, but if the dollar is not tied to gold and other currencies are not tied to the dollar, aren't we going to have people playing politics with currencies? And Arthur Burns took a puff on his pipe and said, young man, you'll soon learn that the dollar does not need you to defend it. Now that was my first economic lesson from the greats of our time, and it was absolutely wrong. 25 years later, Paul Volcker wrote a book from around here somewhere, because I was, remember being here with him about that time remember him fly fishing in one of these creeks. He wrote a book called Changing Fortunes with the Japanese finance minister where he confessed that he and Arthur Burns and George Schultz had not met together to even discuss this. They were sent a memo by the Nixon White House that it was time for us, to, that they were to go to Congress and testify to end the Bretton Woods agreements. Well, that ended global stability. When I asked that question, gasoline, I mean oil was uh, 250 to 350 a barrel, and it fluctuated between that. In six months it had gone to $30 a barrel, in 10 months it had gone to $60 a barrel, and we've been on, I think, the oil standard rather than the gold standard. Now, that's oversimplifying, but if Martin Luther King had lived, Hubert Humphrey would have been elected or Robert Kennedy would have been elected. We would have continued the fulfillment of the New Deal. We still would have had to get to the kind of crazy economics we have now, because the kind of crazy economics we have now, which they are thoroughly adept in, is basically produced by technology. And when you can wire transfer money all over the world, more money moves every night in today's world than existed in the world when we were sitting there in the banking committee. So we had to get where we are. The problem is we don't know how we got where we are. Well, can, can I just jump in? To answer your question, John, do you feel like taking a stab at this notion whether capitalism has worked for poor people in the, in the decades since MLK's death? Um, the answer is for the most part no. And Quincy Jones, says it takes 20 years to change a culture. Um, I'd argue uh, with regard to education as an example, as a snapshot, in the last 20 years we've made dumb sexy. We've sort of dumbed down and celebrated it. And we've got to make smart sexy again. Um, when you look at, there's a great David Brooks article that came out called The Opportunity Gap, came out actually as a result of the Ideas Festival at Aspen a couple days ago. And he, and he frames a 20-year snapshot between, uh, I think it was 75 and 95, where all of the good things for the wealthy youth 
doubled positively upward, and all the bad things for inner city and minority youth uh, went in the opposite direction, doubling, in some cases quadrupling. Um, what does that have to do with your question? Andrew Young, Ambassador Andrew Young, once told me that communism failed because it could not create a middle class. Right. A, a proof of that is you have a communist country, China, now embracing capitalism. That capitalism succeeded precisely because it could create a, a middle class. But capitalism has begun to falter because it has not made itself useful to the, and relevant to the least of these God's children. Um, that my next book will probably be How the Poor Can Save Capitalism. I Amen. literally believe that with the exception of war and government contracting, government opportunity, all wealth in the world, let me say most all wealth in the world, uh, has come through the poor. Um, you can look at almost anything, let, let, let's look at the cell phone. 20 years ago, you and I carried a brick on our shoulder called a Motorola. Remember the Motorola, Motorola brick phones? It was mm. 20 pounds, it cost about $3,000. It was 80 cents a minute or something like that. Um, I was proud to have that phone, but it was an elite tool. It was a, it was a badge of, of honor, because the reception was really crappy. So you didn't get it because you could have a great phone call. You couldn't even hang up, you know, get somebody to hang up uh, nicely. Thank God for digital. Um, but, but now Africa would probably become the first wireless continent. You have people who don't have running water and don't have uh, uh, a, a roof over their head, but they have a cell phone in Africa. Uh, uh, the landline phone. It was a toy for the rich. But Ma Bell did not take off until the least of these God's children had access to a landline phone. Uh, earlier you asked me about how love can make money. Uh, I think it's related. I'm welling with affection right now just thinking about it. <laughs> so you'll have to explain it to me. And so well, uh, Henry Ford innovated. He didn't invent. He innovated the automobile. There were people who invented the ball bearing and invented the windshield wiper. And in, but those things, you know, no different than uh, Dr. Keene didn't go to the, the mall in Washington and said, I have a dream of 2% GDP growth. Mm -hmm. uh, that wouldn't have affected anybody. The Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. Uh, that Henry Ford innovated the idea of an automobile and an automobile industry and then paid his workers enough to buy the car they were building. That's love leadership. It was also the birth of the middle class. Uh, I, you can go on and on and on of uh, Walmart, the biggest retailer in the world, um, serves the least of these God children. It was a company designed to provide quality pro products for working class people. It also is, by the way, the largest employer of black people in the world, a little known fact. Uh, so love does make money. Capitalism uh, really has been saved in the past by the poor, although the poor has not gotten credit for it. And, and what's happened in the last 20 years, I think a little bit more than that, is that we've gone from people treating people like relationships to treating them like transactions. If, if, if you were a mortgage company and you treated everybody that is if, every client as if they were your grandmother, you will never have a mortgage crisis. Um, if, if you're focused on transactions, that's about me and not about we. If you're focused on transactions, that's about what do I get, not what do I have to give. If you're focused on transactions, it's about I want to get paid, I want to get rich right now. Not I want to build wealth over time, which is a completely different approach. Uh, and so it's been a short-term, me-based, fear-based, what do I get, when do I get it, how do I get it, I'm tired of talking about me, now you talk about me, approach. It's the only time in my life where the pimp on my street and the guy on Wall Street, no disrespect intended, is the same guy. Mm -hmm. Because they were focused on the, the, the idea of how do I get paid, not how do I build any wealth. How, it's about me and what do I get, not what do I have to give. And I think that we, we have, excuse me Kabir, because we were arguing about this lovingly outside, we have lost our storyline. Uh, we have forgotten what we're here <coughs> for. We won the battle and lost the war. And we've hit a wall. This is not a recession. This is a reset. This is not an economic crisis. This is a crisis of virtues and values. And we, in that way, we've got to reimagine ourselves, reimagine free enterprise and capitalism so that it works for all people. Last point, to, to, to interconnect this. I think the truth has to be universal. What happened with, with Mohammed in Tunisia was economic. It wasn't about democracy. Mohammed had a cart business. Muhammad, that's how Muhammad, I call it financial dignity. That's how he took care of his family, sent his kids to school, put a roof over their head. It was the dignity that he possessed. Well, Muhammad's cart was taken from him. He went to the police station and said, 
what do I have to do? You don't have a permit. Okay, how much is a permit? There is no price. There is no permit. Realizing he was being gamed, there was no hope. He went outside and set himself on fire. Well, 30 days later, the whole government came down, passed forward to Egypt now. You know, when, Muhammad, when Mubarak went in, it was 30 million people, give or take. Well, GDP growth supposedly was growing. But now you got 90 million people. You got people on the internet, young people, connected people, but it wasn't growing for the 60 million outside of the bandwidth of the elite 30 million. And it was the economy and the lack of opportunity and the lack of jobs that brought down that government. Europe's problem is not more freedom, a cry for more democracy. It's a failing currency and a failing economic system and not enough jobs. Occupy Wall Street, you can go on and on and on. All of this is economic, in my opinion. And if you don't understand, let's get down real basic to financial literacy. If you don't understand the global language of money and you don't have a bank account, you're an economic slave. So this is the new civil rights movement. This is the new civil rights issue. It's what I think Dr. King would be doing if he was alive today. Uh, this is the only way you stabilize a democracy. Middle class folks don't want a war, they want to go to shop. And, and, I, and so I think that we have an opportunity to reimagine our country and our world. Uh, and I think that in many ways you can call this the God crisis because nothing else is going to stop some of us from the mission that we were on of being all about me, I, and, you know, and what I can buy. And, uh, and I think that we have uh, a, a, an opportunity and maybe even no other choice but to reframe everything and look at it with a new lens and a new way in a way that actually now pushes free enterprise and capitalism in a way that actually speaks to and brings up and carries forth more of our world's people. All right, there, there are about 20 follow-up questions <laughs> in that, but um, Kabir does not believe that we have lost our narrative. But, but also your question was on capitalism, right? Yes, yeah, so what, what, what was the question? What is capitalism, to answer Ambassador Young's question, is right. capitalism working for the poor? I think absolutely. Okay. As I traveled the world, I mean, last year at Ideas Festival, this is my second time to Aspen, I love coming here, and uh, last year I was at some panel uh, discussion and someone asked the question, who is the most important um, innovator or most important person in world history over the last 30 years? The Google guys, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, or Mamon Singh and Deng Xiaoping in China? And the answer that most people answered was the technological visionaries, but it was really Mamon Singh in India and the leadership in in China that empowered um, capitalism to, to follow through in a lot of these, these two big countries. And that enabled a manufacturing base so that we could build iPhones and iPads. So we've created 300 million people, 300 million uh, folks have entered into the emerging, emerging, and emerging markets have entered into the middle class, which is phenomenal. Show me any other system of government that's ushered in capital and freedom, and I, I mean, you travel through India, you see people coming to you on the side of the street wanting to sell you magazines and wanting, see, feeling that they can work up their way through society, much, much like in China as well. I mean, there's not a, a more capitalist society right now than China and India. And you can look at the world and say, you can say America, well, we're, we've lost this narrative. We, I think the great kind of gift we've given this world is free markets and saying, you know, we can you, you look at what the, what, how the civil rights movement came about. It was a reason, there was a reason why Coca-Cola was kind of at the forefront of the civil rights movement. When, they, when, Guzueta, excuse me, when, when Robert Woodruff had uh, these Brazilian folks from Coca-Cola come in, he said, listen, when these Brazilian folks from Coca-Cola office, they're treated like second class citizens in Atlanta. We need to integrate this city. So he whispered to then the mayor of Atlanta, we need to integrate the city. So in many ways, business, was the forerunner of an integrated society. Business, capitalism, was an, it was an image of America the beautiful. It was America, American business was integrating long before our politics were. You, you talk in the book, and, and we'll get to this in a minute, but about say, businesses. I agree with both of them. Oh. <laughs> but the other thing is, all, all, all these technological solutions, <coughs> like, yes, we, we, have a new, we have new phones, we have new uh, innovations, that's, that's brought about by an emerging middle class in different worlds. Uh, you know, a, a, a child with a, with a future in India is not worse or not better than a child in America. I think we can, we can grow together. John's about to jump out of his seat. L let me, let me <laughs> stop oh, John and oh, say oh, that, come that, on, that, that, no, <laughs> that, that you're talking about two different worlds. You're talking about America, he's talking about China and India. 
And well, the same thing could be said of Nigeria, South Africa, and Korea. Capitalism is working for poor people. I mean, absolutely. when I was growing up, my mama told me every day, eat everything on your plate. Think of all the cho hungry children in China. That's the way we grow up. When I went to China, they're still hungry children, but they're not in Shanghai, Beijing, and uh, they, they're out in the out. There's still a billion people in China for whom capitalism is not working. Right. And there's still a billion people in India. But so both of them can be right. Go ahead, John. I'll make two very short points. Number one, and I respect everything you said. I think you're brilliant, and I love your book. Um, so another, none of this is personal. I'm passionate, but this is, none of this is personal. I just have a very strong uh, view. Number one, um, for 100 years, this country has been about an idea. People were passionate. Entrepreneurs were passionate about an idea. Ted Turner was passionate about an idea. You just mentioned Steve Jobs, I think. Uh, but whatever, fill in the blank, an idea. They were passionate about an idea. The money was a byproduct of the idea working. The money, the fame, the fortune. What's happened now? You talk to anybody who wants to be a rap star athlete, who wants to be a, a, a banker, a CEO, an entrepreneur, a Wall Street, whatever. Why are you doing it? I want to get paid. The, the money has become the product. That's what I'm saying. It's not, I'm, not, I'm not arguing with free enterprise and capital. I, I'm a capitalist. I'm a capitalist for the poor. But when the, pro, when the byproduct becomes a product, you've lost your storyline. And that's our problem, is that when everybody's obsessed with the money, not the idea, not how do I create. The guy told me, well, I just made $50 million. Really, how'd you do that? Well, I shorted the stock of that company. OK, well, there was a market maker on the other side of that stock. They, they, there were employees on the other side. There were vendors of that company. The company seemed to be doing well. They're, now they're in a free fall. The vendors aren't being paid. People are being unemployed. And the company is losing, has lost you know, x million dollars. How'd you make, you didn't make 50 million, it was a transfer of wealth, it wasn't, an, it wasn't a creation of wealth. Even he uh, needs financial literacy coursework. We have confused ourselves uh, that, that because it works for me, it works for everybody else. Here's my last point. If you're, if you're, forget India for the moment, forget China for the moment, let's go right here to the richest country on the planet Earth. 70% of all black men today are dropping out of high school. Let me let you just, let me let this just sink in for a minute. Bef and before you think that's really bad, 30% of all kids are dropping out of high school. In the richest country on the planet, 40 to 50% of urban kids are dropping out of high school. If free enterprise and capitalism was working for the poor, this would not be true. Black kids in particular want to be rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers. <coughs> not because they're dumb or they're stupid. These kids are brilliant. They're modeling what they see. Their images of success in their neighborhood are not business people, folks with suits on, bankers, uh, uh, doctors, lawyers, capitalists, uh, it, capitalists of industry. They don't even know what those folks look like. They, the, the images that they see as success are rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers. And guess what? Between do I stay in school, which is not relating to aspiration to me, or do I go do that? Guess what? They go do that. And I think it actually is a, based on what they're looking at, not an irrational state. If you, if you meet a successful drug dealer, I know it's an oxymoron, the drug dealer will go to, you know, should go to prison and, and should go to hell too. Unless he has an MD degree. <laughs> okay, let, let, okay, let's move on. That's brilliant, but hold on. <laughs> of course, he always just throws in the... <laughs> but if there is a successful drug dealer, they're immoral, they're unethical, but they're not dumb. You, you understand, import, export, finance, marketing, wholesale, retail, customer service, profit margin, geography, territory, security. These are not dumb kids, they're misdirected kids with a bad business model and bad role models and no connection to free enterprise and capitalism that we would endorse or would lift anybody up. Well, let me, let me just- So you got all these brilliant kids no, who are ending up in let prison. Me take you back, let me take you back to the beginning. <laughs> okay. This was an <laughs> argument That between, was intended to stop me, by the way. No, this was, no, yeah. But Which this worked. was an argument between Thomas Jefferson, who was a distinguished intellectual, and, and Alexander Hamilton, who taught himself on the docks. Mm. See, and uh, that's a battle we've always had. It's one of the things that makes America great. It. It'd be terrible if 
Thomas Jefferson had won and we didn't have an Alexander Hamilton. And it would also be terrible if Alexander Hamilton had totally monetized democracy. Which is why I said it's not So personal. the tension that we are living with now is inherent in the nature of our country. It's also inherent in the nature of the world in which we live. We should see and can see technology as an opportunity to unite it and take us to another level. And uh, rather than just uh, the exploiter that, um, and I got some answers to that, but I'll let somebody else well, talk Well, I actually, John, I think we, we, we want to get to the, how you redirect the misdirected. But uh, before we get there, I want to talk a little bit more about capitalism because you redirected him at a moment when he was about to help people in severe need in New Orleans. You were down in New Orleans, you called up your Uncle Andy, and you said, I want to help these people. Can you explain that? The story. I was in New Orleans. I was in New Orleans um, right before Katrina, and uh, I was researching this uh, this book on jazz music. And uh, the wind started to come in. We started to get the, the hurricane warnings, and Katrina struck. And uh, it was right after Katrina, right th the, the days after. I said, you know, I want to be here. I just graduated college. I like to be here, uh, stay here, and make a difference. And the way I wanted to contribute was, a lot of the musicians had left. 90% of the musicians had left. And New Orleans, for those who have been, New Orleans is not New Orleans without the musicians and without the food, because the music's actually an, a huge cultural industry. It contributes $300 million to the economic society of, uh, of, of New Orleans. So I called Uncle Andy and I said, I like to stay here and I like to, uh, to, to uh, be part of the, re the resurrection. And uh, he said to me, if you really want to help people, if you really want to help New Orleans, go work for an investment bank. And I said, come again. <laughs> and uh, and that's, then I moved to London and, and, I, and I ended up working at J.P. Morgan. But maybe you want to explain why you said that. Yeah, because when I, I grew up in New Orleans, I played on those levees. Uh, I watched the, the CCC camps build those levees and the Corps of Engineers build the spillways. So I was really familiar with the details of New Orleans problems. And New Orleans is 75% under sea, below sea level. And so there's no temporary fix. It takes a macroeconomic adjustment. And I was at that time involved with uh, the privatization of Cox Enterprises and some Goldman Sachs people. And uh, w I was saying if I was the mayor of New Orleans, I would do, if, I, if, if something like that happened in Atlanta, I would hock the airport. I would refinance the airport and I'd generate 10, 12 billion dollars as quickly as I could. Then I wouldn't wait for the government. I'd start investing in the reconstruction and development. Uh, only problem is New Orleans doesn't have a double A credit rating like Atlanta does. So, but one of the guys with us said, but there's a, there's a, a core of natural gas under New Orleans and Lake Pontchartrain and because New Orleans, my parents, didn't vote for Huey Long, Huey Long wouldn't let every parish in Louisiana can drill for oil but Orleans Parish. And I said, we don't need to drill for it. And I'm talking to one of Goldman Sachs' top men. I said, look, couldn't we use that, that store of oil and gas to monetize Katrina development bonds? Uh, at that time, we could have sold $100 billion worth of bonds around the world because Katrina had captured the imagination of the world. What I was talking about was what we did to build Atlanta. We financed our airport with tax-exempt municipal bonds. And even during the downturn, our tax-exempt bonds on the airport were paying 6% tax-exempt, uh, which is equivalent to 9 or 10%. And, um, creating a vehicle like that. Then the, we were doing some work with Chevron in Nigeria, and the guys from Chevron had been with Texaco, and they said, yeah, we have been coveting uh, that store. You easily have a $100 billion asset under Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans. So I immediately began to, in fact, we went to see President Bush mm -hmm. uh, and tried to convince them that they could with an executive order, issue a Katrina uh, tax-exempt municipal bond. 
and create a hundred billion dollar fund. And I said to him then, and it's still true, I said, look, this is not a New Orleans problem. This is a Mississippi Valley problem. Two years later, four years later, 33 states from um, North Dakota right on down the Mississippi, 33 states flooded. And uh, so there's no safer investment in the world, no safer place to put your money than the Mississippi Valley. There's just no vehicle with which to do it, see? So we were talking about creating a macroeconomic vehicle. And it would have gotten George Bush a place in history, uh, you know, for, for doing something like that. But we were there the day that Karl Rove got in, you know, accused of leaking the thing about uh, the CIA lady in Niger. Niger. Yeah. Uh, and nobody was, I mean, they looked at us like we were crazy, but they went out and checked our facts and everything we said was true, but there was nobody capable of making a decision. So that's an idea that I've been trying to, to sell, that we don't need a jobs program. Uh, I mean, the Atlanta airport cost us somewhere between 20 and $25 billion over 30 years. But presently, it earns $32.5 billion every year. And it creates directly 60,000 jobs. And the multiplier effect is probably closer to a million jobs directly, uh, indirectly around that airport. Why can't we find a project like the Atlanta airport in every major city or between New Orleans and Minneapolis? You, I, I, just playing around, I don't do the computer very well, but playing around since the president came from Illinois, I checked in the Corps of Engineers and their report on the flooding in Illinois two years ago. Uh, 72,000 families had to be relocated. The flood damage was $17 billion. I said, now we know it's gonna flood if not this year, next year, or the year after that. Why in the hell can't we spend that $17 billion forward instead of bailing this out after the flood? And then I remembered, that's why we don't flood in Atlanta. We don't flood in Atlanta because Franklin Roosevelt's continuation of the New Deal. See, Franklin Roosevelt, because of his polio, came down to Georgia to Warm Springs, Georgia. So he got very familiar with that East Coast. And so the Corps of Engineers, you see Lake Lanier, Lake Altoona, uh, Minnesota's the land of 10,000 lakes, but Atlanta is, I mean, Georgia has got a, a, a thousand man-made lakes that were made by the Corps of Engineers that generated wealth for resort properties, uh, that generated electricity for the entire South, that provides clean, fresh water for uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and a little bit of Tennessee. Uh, this was an economic plan under the New Deal. It was big government at its best. See? Now, we can't do that now, but why couldn't we do what I call public purpose capitalism? Why couldn't we take that idea that worked for Roosevelt with government money, and it probably would work with government money, but Republicans don't want to argue about that now. But let's do it with private money in the Mississippi Valley. And let's generate new wealth by dealing with the environmental problems that are related to all of our lives. 33 states, if you carry 33 states, especially those 33 states, you can always be president. Uh, and, but if the president could get 10 bankers together, not to talk about LIBOR, uh, but to talk about, look, the hell with what LIBOR is. The question is, what are you going to do with the money after you get it? We want you to do something in the Mississippi Valley. We don't care what. We just want it to meet a human need, create jobs, and make a profit. Um, so you actually pushed Kabir into, you speak of capitalism almost like the movement. Because I wanted him to think like I was just Well, you, you made him 
what you said in the book, Kabir, a foot soldier, a foot soldier in the nonviolent capitalist revolution. Yeah. Right? But he wasn't, a, he's not a foot soldier, see? He's sitting on the, on an $80 billion hedge fund. Yeah, and stop, so stop right there. So this, this, this look, Kabir should admire Ambassador Young. He does. <laughs> can I, I do, I do. Can I, I do. can I, can I just get a, uh, my own sentencing? Yeah. Uh, uh, that's my play father over there. Um, you should admire Ambassador Young and he don't have to admire me. In fact, it's okay. No, if he, he admires will you. Will you too. let me finish? I do. Will you let me finish? None of that's important. I don't care whether you like me. I, be the, be precisely because of what Ambassador Young just said, you're sitting on this hedge fund, you've, you've, you, you're gonna be su extraordinarily successful in life. And I don't want you comfortable, excuse me for anybody recording this, I don't you want you comfortable about shit. The, you gotta be uncomfortable. This world is all screwed up and it needs people like you to fix it. And if you go to bed comfortable at night, um, I don't think that that's the right motive. I think every good marriage is made of constructive friction. And I think that, that Ambassador Young doesn't sleep more than four or five hours a night. Uh, that's a whole other story about Dr. King dying and him being left, us, le left on that balcony and him feeling guilty and responsible. And thank God, because the world has benefited from this man who can't rest because he wants to make the world a better place. I don't want you comfortable. I don't want you thinking free enterprise working for poor people. And so I tell you for two reasons. One is I'm, I've served two million people. If I go in front of my clients right now and say free enterprise and capitalism is working for you, they will knock my block off. Uh, so we're doing work in the trenches every day and it's not working for them. Or at least the perception is it's not working for them. At the very least, you've got to respect that that's their view of the world. Number two, I don't think that you get anywhere by saying we're good. I, I think that you get somewhere by saying, how do we make it better? How do you push yourself to be better, to redouble the effort? So, so I'm, a, I'm for capitalism, free enterprise. Uh, I, I admire what you're doing, uh, but I'm not going to but I'm not going to agree with you that things are okay, and I'm not going to agree with you that you're doing enough, and I'm not going to agree that, that we're on the right path. Because one, one, I don't believe it, but two, I think you can do a heck of a lot more if your envelope is pushed. But um, what, what we're doing, though, is we're trying to steer a path between Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street, both of which yeah. I think are irrelevant. <laughs> but there is a very wide superhighway of economic opportunity between those two that the next president of the United States, whoever it is, has got to define and make work. Um, let's dwell on this for a second. Or so, the next big major banker. So, Kabir, you're at JPM, you're yes, in sir. Midtown, no doubt. <coughs> Occupy Wall Street folks were coming and they were thinking, not what Ambassador Young was thinking, that you would be part of the solution. They were probably protesting outside your window, thinking you're part of the problem. Why are they part of the solution? Why is Occupy Wall Street part of the solution? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I, I agree with, their, with the thrust of their argument that, you know, the system uh, too big to fail. We were all kind of dismayed. But will it matter? Occupy Wall Street movement? Yes. Well, I'm not sure because usually, I mean, there's, there's been studies of how much of, a, how much of a society needs to protest before it, an idea sort of takes off, right? Some people say it's a tenth of a percent. The, the colonial uh, revolutionary war got to, I think, a little bit more than that. And the protests in Russia have failed because of this. Um, it doesn't seem like uh, they were as organized, perhaps. Maybe they could have bought shares in a company and come to shareholders meetings. That's one, just one idea. I don't know. Um, why they were extremely ineffective in creating a sustained dialogue. I think perhaps, you know, to, it's one thing to compare, to, to invoke the civil rights movement. It's kind of a, you know, a message for dignity. We all need a job. We all need a, we all need a bank account. That's great. I'm not sure of the tactics of the civil rights movement, which is uh, protesting and, uh, you know, banging on drums. While can, can be effective in some places, and you, you said this, it may not be the right tactic to bring about social change right now. And that might be a, a difference of, yeah, we can, we can invoke the civil rights movement, but what are the tactics to, uh, to bring about change? Well, let's talk about that. John, they're making an argument that um, seems to agree with half of the people you're serving that about income inequality. Is that movement helpful in any way? I think it's very helpful. How? Um, uh, well, I mean, first of all, let me say that I, I don't think you can actually compare uh, Occupy Wall Street to the civil rights movement. There was, uh, first of all, Dr. King was- They did, a, they did. Like a lot of people were saying, this is our civil rights movement. <laughs> well, let me say, I don't think they can compare. Sure, sure, uh, I agree. Uh, thanks. I don't think they can compare themselves to the civil rights movement. One, Dr. King was an optimist. He was a strategist, that was a strategist. 
Um, he was about what we were for, not what we were against. Um, he, he, was, he, was an, he was inclusive. I mean, uh, he, said, he said the civil rights movement is, not, is, here, is here to save black men's bodies and white men's souls. Translation, we're all in this together. And one of my mentors said, you got to talk without being offensive, listen without being defensive, and always leave even your adversary with their dignity. Mm -hmm. That's why Dr. King said Andrew Young behind closed doors during the marches to meet with business leaders in every small town because he knew that their pocketbooks were being squeezed by all the marches, and he gave them a dignified way out to agree to um, concessions without having to embarrass them in public. What got integrated in the South in the Civil Rights Movement wasn't government buildings, wasn't universities, public universities. It was private enterprise. It was a, it was a lunch counter at Woolworths. It was private enterprise that integrated the, the South, but it was the way in which they went about it. The, doc, the, pro, the only problem with Occupy Wall Street is everything. They've not figured out what they're for. And, and, and you cannot be, make a business out of what you're against. So, so they have become, they are relevant though because they have caused people to become uncomfortable and have caused folks to at least illustrate and focus on an area that needed incredible intention. They've raised the question, they just can't provide the answer. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what is needed now, in my opinion, is a positive answer to Occupy Wall Street. They've teed it up, now you've got to pay it off. And that's, frankly, some of the stuff that, that I'm so that's, 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 like a, that's like a, what he's saying, the Katrina bonds. Um, Admiral Mullen, who was the former head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he has a couple of strategists that worked on what is a new American narrative. And they're trying to create what's called sustainability bonds. And that's come up with infrastructure projects and go to a private capital, whether it be large asset managers, and try to come up with a way for private capital to move into you know, this kind of a, a bipartisan, agreed upon projects, infrastructure projects. I was just in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and about a week ago, and I was so stunned that they're repaving their ins entire country. 92, they're raising about, I think, 40 to $50 billion. 92% of the money is coming from the private sector, and there's, there's about uh, 20 new starts a week. About, uh, and so they're actually rebuilding their entire economy with private capital, American capital coming in to develop uh, a new Malaysia. And I said, it's called the Economic Transformation Program. So why couldn't we have something like a Katrina we bond? Had it in right. Why can't we use that as, as a microcosm, and that could be part of the solution? Sustainability bonds. Imagine, imagine a press conference where we had Admiral Mullen, he had CEOs of big investment banks, he had Barack Obama, and he said, "Listen, here are the ten projects we're going to do. We're going to um, raise eighty percent of capital um, from the private sector. We'll pick twenty percent of the capital from the from the public sector, and we're just going to do it." And that could be a wouldn't be that wouldn't that be a wonderful public relations effort for one, but it would also be a, a magnificent uh, place where business could fulfill its kind of historic role as being the uh, kind of, you talk about the, the civil rights movement. Business could take the forerun, uh, for, be, be the forerunner in in bringing about real positive change as it did in the civil rights movement. What what John said though about the civil, about business community. We forget that it was the business community that desegregated the South. You call it the it agent not, of social change. It was not the government. Right. It was not George Wallace. Uh, it was uh, U.S. Steel and Woolworth and uh, Hilton who owned the, the businesses there. Uh, but the thing that, that the best book I read accidentally when I was elected mayor, which I didn't want to be, I stumbled onto a book by Jane Jacobs called Cities and the Wealth of Nations. And it says that all wealth is, is local, that, that mm -hmm. cities generate wealth. Mm -hmm. There are no federal solutions particularly. Federal solutions inevitably get too bureaucratic, but you have to break this down to specific neighborhoods and communities that have a common vision, and then, but the vehicle that Kabir is talking about and that John's asking for could be a federal vehicle that is available to cities, but even with the Olympics, we would not let the city government, the state government, and the county government put, can participate in the Atlanta Olympics. Because when, when the government took hold of Greece, Oh, when the government took hold of Montreal, Canada's got a good government, but the government left Montreal $700 billion in debt 10 years after the Olympics had gone. We ran the Olympics as a private sector venture that 
raised two and a half billion dollars privately. We managed it well. We put on the Olympics, the biggest and best Olympics in history, for $2.4 billion. We had $100 million left over. But the newspapers did not believe we had done it. They couldn't believe how we pull off this miracle. They figured we'd done something. And they kept us in court, took us to Congress. And we, we, we spent almost $100 million defending ourselves for running an honest, efficient, effective private sector uh, 2000, I mean, uh, 1996 Olympic Games. John, what are some of the other small differences? I, I kind of want to focus on low-hanging fruit to some extent, but I also want to address your, the issue you brought up about how you sort of rewrite the entire promise and how you take the people that you were talking about who have the worst models, not the worst, but who have bad models. No, the worst. OK. Yeah. Um, and suddenly change that, because that actually sounds like a huge problem. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to deal with both. What are the things that we could do quickly and easily that would make what the small differences that would have a great sum of change? And then what are the bigger things that need to be done? And then we, we really do have to open it up to your questions. Well, I think that, um, first of all, we've got to redefine freedom. Um, I think freedom in the 20th century was the right to vote. Um, why do people come to America? Because uh, they were being um, uh, oppressed in their nation. So it now was it's a, a democratization. Right to freedom. Hmm? Now it's a right to economic Well, so my Pakistani driver in D.C., I asked him, why'd you come to America? Because of freedom. Uh, now you run a business, uh, you, may, you have two cars, I make, I imagine you make work 12, 12 hours a day, I imagine you make about $90,000 a year, you, have, you don't see your family much, you, you're not at home on weekends, you're with me in, from 7 in the morning and 10 at night. Why do you do this? It can't be 20% you know, annualized return, it can't be 8% GDP growth, it can't be you want to get rich. He says, no, freedom. For him, self-determination was the new freedom. And, I, and, I, and so I think that if that's the new benchmark to make, and this is an Ambassador Andrew Young quote, that the mission of the civil rights movement is to make free enterprise and capitalism work for the poor, to make it relevant to the poor. Then how do you do that? Two strategies. Uh, we're building a Hope Financial Dignity Center at Ebenezer Church. It's about 90% complete. It'll be, uh, we're gonna cut the ribbon in November. This is uh, uh, right at the King Center, where Dr. King's crypt is. Uh, what people don't know is that Daddy King, Dr. King's father, served on the board of a bank for 40 years. He co-founded a bank. So you, and Dr. King and Daddy King used to get into it all the time about the nature of capitalism and free enterprise. But let's look at that. Dr. King didn't work for a salary. How do you get a PhD in 1958 as a black man in Alabama? That means your family was a big ball and shot calling. Mm -hmm. The King family weren't poor. Andrew Young's family wasn't poor, they were dentists. So free enterprise and capitalism, to your point, of course is alive and well, and in some ways it's the responsibility, the guilt, I'm gonna call it, from some of these folks who did so well that made them wanna give back. I know that I, feel, I felt guilty initially and wanted to, to do something to give, to give back, make sure other people had the opportunity that, that I had. Um, but, but people sort of miss the fact that Daddy King, which bailed, who bailed Dr. King out of jail, was a capitalist. Now, uh, we're building this Hope Center at Ebenezer. What's our goal? 700 credit score communities. What am I going to do? That, that neighborhood is a 500 or 550 credit score neighborhood. So you can pick it payday lenders all you want. You can pick it check cashers all you want. You can give moral speeches all you want. They aren't going anywhere because they are target marketing a customer. It's not a moral issue. They are target marketing a 500 and 550 credit score customer. We are moving credit scores 120 points. K sorry, question. Am I going too I've, fast? No, I just want to ask a question because once you get people to the 700 cre credit score, I've noticed over the past f four years that banks, not all of them seem to be really loving getting involved in banking. So why is it that you think that- I'm sorry, that-, that, who, that, that banks seem to have an aversion to actually ban banking. banking. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, so why do you think that once you get them to 700 credit score that they'll be, they'll, banks will well, be lending to them? Well, uh, we'll, ha we'll, have credit, that? we'll have credit unions if we okay. don't. Yeah, I, I think and most of those churches in that neighborhood do have credit unions. And so once he does his job of, because I, I didn't know what a credit score was, frankly. I was a biology major. <laughs> uh, and uh, but my daddy and mama were cheap, so I, I had good credit. Uh, but teaching people about the language of money is his business. And starting it with fourth grade, uh, 
they did for us. And that's what we, I mean, without saying they were teaching us to save, when we were coming up, how many of you had a little book with defense stamps in it? That you had to, every, every Monday you had to bring your defense stamp book and the money you made over the weekend and fill up the defense stamp yeah, books the for the war effort. So, I mean, we, we had in the, in the 40s uh, and in the 30s, we had a economic, I mean, we had financial literacy. We didn't call it that, we called it defense stamps. But they taught us to save. And I accidentally, when somebody came to try to sell my daddy some mutual funds, uh, and he didn't have any money because he was saving it to send me to college. I remembered, I said, Mama, what happened to all of those defense stamps and bonds I used to have? She said, they're still there. I said, can I take those and give them to, to uh, Fidelity and make some money, more money? The guy said, you sure can. See, so uh, it, it turns out that I had about 200 and some dollars saved up. Well. I was, I was just getting ready to go to college, I think. And when I got out of college, my daddy didn't want me to be a preacher. Uh, he said, so all that's the preachers, exactly what you did, right? All the preachers I know are poor or crooked. Uh, and I'll pay your way to any school <laughs> but a seminary. Wait a minute, his dad was, wait a minute, he's being, he's being commissioned for the UN ambassadorship. So he said, he's, he's there at the State Department. He, the Vice President of the United States was the Vice President. No, it's the President said to his daddy, you must be really proud of your son. He's becoming the UN ambassador for the United States of America. His daddy, without missing a beat, said, nah, not really. He'd have really been something if he was a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, it uh, that money had made enough money to help me buy my first car during the four years I was in college. So I, I got an accidental financial education. What John is doing is intentionally doing that. And he needs to tell you about business in a box. So what is the next, um, you, I, think I interrupted you, you the, the credit score thing was Can part one of a two-part issue. Water? It's a little more water. Uh, well, yeah, so yeah. there's two strategies, the use strategy and the dose strategy. The, this, the, the bottom line on the credit score piece is this. If you can move credit scores from, six, from 550 to 670, 120 points, and Operation Hope has done that over, over 18 months in our Hope Centers, by the way. The guy who made this suit, we put in business after moving, moving his credit scores 120 points. If you can do that over five years, liquor stores turn into convenience stores through market forces. And check cashers, payday loan lenders, title lenders, and rent to own stores turn into credit unions and banks over five years through market forces. You don't need to pick at anybody, you don't need to give anybody a moral speech. And by the way, I told, I told Cordray, who, who runs CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, you, if you have, people have more consumer empowerment, they need less consumer protection, mm -hmm. okay? So, so that's where I think free enterprise and capitalism in a practical way, where it is pushed down to the least of these guys' children and then raises them up with financial dignity, and then you have changes the whole, models. and you create taxpayers, what? And you have your new models for you. And by the way, that so-called poor neighborhood is now an emerging market, not a poor neighborhood. The, but that's not my, the biggest idea. The biggest idea is what Ambassador Young just mentioned, which is hold business in a box. And we think it just changes everything. We, we have a 100-year commitment from Gallup. Um, and we're going to go school by school across America. Give me the toughest school in any, in any neighborhood. Um, and we'll show you can be transformed. And here's what here, we're calling it the America 2020 campaign. We're actually launching it uh, today. Uh, by, uh, by the year 2020, every school in America, particularly every underserved community, will double the level of their financial literacy in that school. Double the level of the economic energy in that school. The energy is there, it's not organized, that's why you've got these drug but dealers. But how are you doing that? I'll get to it in a second. Okay. And then quadruple the level of business role models and business internships. If you can quadruple the level of business internship and business role models, you crush the dropout rate because now you're giving kids something positive to see and now they aspire to something, and now they get what they really want, which is an opportunity. A kid either wants a good job or an opportunity. They don't want to lecture about graduation, and they don't want to lecture about good grades. No different than you don't want a mortgage. You want to become a homeowner. Mm -hmm. So the way we do it is you go in the first door, you give them the first day, and you give them a course in dignity, which is internal wealth. The next time you give them a financial literacy coursework with Ambassador Young just mentioned. The next thing you do uh, is a primer course in entrepreneurship which is what Kabir just talked about. The next thing is 25 businesses you can start for $500 or less. 
So now ele every, ele every ele elementary school kid can start a business for 50 to 100 bucks. A middle school kid, 250 bucks. A high school kid, 500 bucks. We tell the kid to pick one. Why? Because we're coming back to that school. That school, in 45 days, we're going to do a pitch event in their auditorium. Think Shark Tank for kids. Now you have eight business leaders. Has to be local. I don't want any stars. I don't want anybody that people can't reach. The local doctor, dentist, always on that stage. When the kids go up and they have two minutes to pitch their idea, only two minutes. The, the little thing is there and the, the clock starts. Now somebody knows somebody, they're, they're listening to them, they're paying attention to them, they're observing them. They have two minutes to pitch their idea. If they pitch well, congratulations, you got a $500 whole business in the box grant. There's a bunch of things that come in the box, I won't go into the details, but one of them is a certificate for the 500 bucks, which you can only get if your parent or guardian uh, or your business role model takes you to a, to a credit union or bank and opens a bank account in your own name. Now you got kids on smartphone videos being opening an account at a local institution and all that going up to the local whole business box website for everybody else to watch. We're, then the business role model spends an hour a week for six weeks help, helping that get st kids stand up their business. And that gets measured every six months by the Gallup Hope Index. If you can do that, so, so you start out with 1,000 kids. Let's be the most pessimistic you can imagine. 50 kids pitch. Out of 1,000 kids, 50 kids pitch. Still success. Because of the book, The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell, proved that in 5% of role models, every community stabilizes. So if you have 50 kids on the stage pitching their heart out, and the rest of them looking at the kids pitch, you're now changing the culture of the school, but now you, let's say at, 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 you, you fund 20 businesses at $500 each. We intentionally run out of money at 20. Now the 21st kid goes up and pitches their heart out. They just kill it. There's no more money. What happens in the audience? Somebody comes up with the money. Somebody raises their hand and goes, okay, oh Jesus, oh, oh, 500 bucks, I I'm in, I'm in. By the way, kid, come by to my, my, my insurance office next Tuesday and spend some time with me. Or the local gas station owner, or the local uh, dentist, or the local banker. Oh, okay, okay, Jesus, Jesus, I, I'm in. And 10 other kids go up there and kill it, and it'll happen every time. Now you got stone soup. Now you got the community saving itself. And that's the model for America. And we found that in the Gallup Hope Index, 91% of all kids are not afraid to take risks. 77% of all kids want to be their own boss. 44% of all kids want to own their own business. I think it's interesting that the 44 and the 77 are, in, are different. Mm -hmm. Another 44% of all kids want to create something that changes the world, but only 5% of kids have a business role model or a business internship in the largest economy in the world. And if you don't gap that 5 and that 77, we're done. In 10 years with a nation that used to run the world. And we did it in Atlanta. In 1965, when Watts rioted and everything else, the business leaders said, we don't want this to happen here. And they said, what can we do to stop it? So we said, we've got to create some summer jobs. So a dozen, a dozen CEOs got together and called their suppliers, their supply chain, and said, how many interns can you take? And everybody took two, three, five, ten. But we created 6,500 summer jobs in about three weeks. Yep. And instead of those kids, the leaders who got the summer jobs, instead of them being in the streets stirring up trouble, they were putting on shirts and yep. ties, yep. going to an office, yep. and most of them stayed with those companies. One of the kids that, that started as an assistant on the back of a Coca-Cola truck is now the number two man in Washington for Coca-Cola. And he's never left the Coca-Cola supply chain. Hmm. All the way through college and Syracuse, you know, Maxwell School, he was a Coca-Cola guy. Uh, and so it was good for the business, but it was especially good for the city and the kids. So capitalism will work if people who understand that capitalism is not individualism. Right. It is a, a group philosophy. You can't be a capitalist alone. And so by the way, so now- You've got to have a market. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was about to say, this is why I'm, I'm pushing. I, I don't want anybody to think that capitalism is working. Because if it's working, then you don't need to do anything I just mentioned. It'll just sort of take care of itself. And it's not taking care of itself. And it won't take care of itself. And you can't raise your children by email. But you're using you've capitalism. Got, you've got to show up. No, you're, go ahead. You're go using ahead. capitalism to solve a problem, capitalism, right? We're in agreement. So it is working. 
No, it's not working. It will work. Uh, no, 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 no. I, so I, I said to Jim Clifton, the chairman and CEO of Gallup, oh, this is the greatest idea I've ever had. He said it is not the well, greatest you idea you ever had because it hasn't worked yet. Yeah, okay. No, but that's a good book I want to plug while we're, because yeah, all of us are, are largely influenced by uh, Jim Clifton's book, uh, yeah, The Coming Jobs, Jobs, Jobs War. And there's a concept in there of uh, behavioral economics, uh, which, uh, I mean, it bothers me why nobody can sell anything in Africa. You can't sell refrigerators and you can't sell automobiles, uh, but Coca-Cola can sell Coca-Cola in every single country. It's because Coca-Cola learns, appreciates, and gets involved in the market. They understand the behavioral economics. And people drink Coke, all of us, whether it's good for us or not. But they bought us into that whole system. And when you're in a 100 degree heat and you got money, why can't somebody sell you an air conditioner and a generator <laughs> if you don't have, you know? Because they're not, willing to take the time to understand the market and run the risk. They just assume that Africa is a dark continent. Or, but they'll go down to Mexico and fight with drug dealers because they've been to Cuernavaca and, and uh, what's that other place you all go to down there? Cabo, Cabo yeah, San Lucas <laughs> and uh, the beaches. That We're comfortable in Mexico. But we're not comfortable in Africa. Can I, we, if I promise not to say anything else, can I say one last thing? I yeah. promise you, it'll be short. Yeah. Um, but we have to get to questions. I, I know. I, this is it. This is, this is through my teeth. I, I'm with you. This is, I promise you, this is it. Because I've been struggling with. I, I'm not. I, I'm frustrated that I cannot. I cannot positively. I cannot a, a answer my, my my frustration. I can articulate the frustration with what Kabir stated in a way that makes sense. Kabir did a great job of articulating his message. I have not done a great job yes, of articulating. No, I actually, yeah. I, I have. So here, here's what I'm saying. During the civil rights movement, Dr. King and Andrew Young knew exactly where everybody stated, where they stood. It was love or hate. People were with you or they're against you. They knew exactly where they were. Today is not love or hate, it's radical indifference. People don't care enough about you to hate you today. Whatever is your, you know, private communities, private gated school, private gated, gated streets, private gated homes, private security, private islands, and and people are detaching uh, uh, and becoming indifferent. And uh, and frankly, I think that the only way this idea works that I just mentioned is if I exhaust myself in the last five years. We we have a, pro a commitment from Denver Public Schools to do what I just told you in every school for Denver. But it, it's going to take me flying into Denver meeting with the local business leaders and talking it into them, and then the, then the local business leaders have to adopt. It could be a local chairman. And by the way, that will only work in Denver. If it's going to be in Aspen, it needs to be somebody in Aspen organizing it. It's got to be somebody in the Silicon Valley organizing it. I'm going to, I'm going to drive myself crazy running across this country, talking this into the nation. Love is work. That's all my only point. It, nothing happens easy. Not a damn thing. That's a good kicker. We have to go to the audience. Um, Ambassador Young will be back momentarily, but questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I got a, a comment and question. The first thing was it, was, it was brought up about Walmart, that Walmart allowed people who were marginal to have jobs. But what the, the follow-up was not included, and that is Walmart did not buy American stuff. They bought it all overseas, plus they're paying minimal wages. But my, my question to you is, in the current political climate where people seem to be unable to talk to each other, there's extremes on the right and the left, uh, how do you picture your plan from both the, uh, Ambassador Young's and uh, Mr. Hale? I'm, I'm John O'Brien. I'm John. John. Just call me John. John. Yeah. John. You're, 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 you're going from two different approaches, and it, it seems to me that it's almost as if the far right and far left were conflicting. Um, how do you resolve this? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's me. I don't completely understand the last question. Let, let me talk about Walmart and Kabir. You, you helped me out here. Uh, there is no perfect. That's my answer. Every company's a little screwed up. Operation Hope is imperfect. A saint is a sinner that got up. 
I didn't, I didn't say work for Walmart for the rest of your freaking life. I said <laughs> Walmart is, is, is the largest employer of black people, and they have a mission of, of, of selling reasonably priced products to the working poor. That's all I said. I didn't say I love them or I own their stock or the, they should get the Nobel Peace Prize. I just said that they're, you know, it's a model of how they've served the, the, the least of these guys' children. I think it is a model. I think there are problems with McDonald's. It's pro I mean, you, I mean, Coca-Cola is selling coca I mean, got coca got literally has cocaine. No, oh, I shouldn't be saying that. No, I, I mean, every, I don't, there is no perfect. So, so yeah, so, 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 so what? The, they, they get their products from China. So does 90% of everybody else. Me and you probably have stuff in our house that we think is American made that comes from China. I think that, that, that we, we don't, I mean, my, my, my response to stuff like that is, and thank you for your question, to not let the perfect be the death of the good. That the founder of LinkedIn is in your book. I, I got it from your book. The founder of LinkedIn said, if you're not slightly embarrassed by your 1.0 software release, you release too late. 